So regard Poisson as binomial NP with N large P small and NP equals lambda. Every time, okay, an event corresponds to the appearance of a heads in the binomial in tossing coins. For the, uh, X equals the Poisson, okay, uh, random variable, which is approximated to the binomial random variable. Okay, okay, is the number. So everybody following this so far? Now, what, is, what they're actually asking in the problem, for a Poisson distribution, suppose that the events are independently labeled A and B. Okay, so every time I get a heads, okay, I'm going to see either it's a heads of type A or a heads of type B independently. Okay? The heads with a, with a, with a mustache or the heads without a mustache. Okay? Uh -huh. Independently. <laughs> Independently, I put a mustache on the head. Okay? What? <laughs> All right? Well, whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Theoretically, I do. Practically, I don't. No, no, I understand. Okay. I, I, I'm tossing I, coins. Yeah. Every, time, every time I get a tail, I do nothing. Every time I get a head, which is the event happening, sure. Sure. Okay? Yeah. I, I mark that one. Independently, either as A or B, with probability P A, I mark it with an A. Okay, so I mark the heads either a, heads A. So every time my head appears, a head appears, which corresponds to events happening. It's almost as if uh, when a Poisson event occurs, you flip a coin. Yeah, you flip and another decide, coin. And decide so something based on the flip. Another coin. Flip another coin. Yeah. So now, every time a head appears, mark it as A or B probabilities, with respect to probabilities. OK? 
Okay, so now basically what you want to do is show that um, the now call XA, right? XA equals number of heads, total number of heads. So the xA plus xB is equal to x, okay? And you want to show that each xA and xB show xA, actually in this situation, is simply uh, probably just binomial, okay? A size n parameter p times pa, right? So xA. That's one way to think about it. So basically go back and say, okay, uh, so go back and think of it in terms of that way if you want. If you want. Um, now the limiting procedure at the end, it should come out in the wash basically. In other words, what I want, I think what I, is enough to show that XA is going to be binomial. Okay? I think that's the way it works out. Let me just check that for you. Did you detect it or not detect it? It's, um, three, five. Example B, suppose a particle encounter is imperfect and independently detects each incoming particle with probability P. So it doesn't detect each one. The distribution of the number of incoming particles in a unit of time is a Poisson distribution with prime time, but what is the distribution of the number of counted particles? There's the exact answer right there. It's the same problem. It took me all weekend to figure that out, but I got there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, if you actually do this uh, in the binomial case, then you get um, okay. This is a little bit tricky. Um, Type, okay, we talk, we flip a large number of coins using small probability P of landing heads. And each time we obtain a head, we label a type A or type B with probabilities P, A, P, B, respectively, independently and on the events of heads. Let X equal the total number of events. That's a Poisson variable. Given X equals little x, the number of Y of type A then is binomial. Okay. That's the key here. Is that what they're doing here? Yes, they're using a condition argument. So actually, I think what I did was, um, I didn't even bother using, and this is one way to think about it, but I didn't, I didn't even bother using this. I actually did use the fact that um, x was Poisson distributed, so I took the limit in my calculation. I didn't even bother with uh, taking a limit here, okay? So in other words, it goes, let me, Right, the first step is well. So the first step exactly there is in the example. Am I supposed to be the example? Okay. So what we're going to do? Is say um, let x equal the total. So x is the Poisson random variable, which is exactly what they did here, right? Well, uh, actually, they called uh, n the Poisson random. Three five example B. 
they changed the notation, so unfortunately. It's a different notation. Okay, so I give you yet another notation, okay? Uh, well, no, I'll just take this one. Okay, so I'm going to use x and xa rather than n and x. Okay, so x equals a Poisson random variable, which you can think of as the number of particles coming in. It's just exactly to a counter. Exactly the same problem. The probability P, it detects. So XA is the number of detected particles. Okay? X of A equals the number of detected particles. <coughs> detection occurs. Well, this is probability it's P, independently for each particle. Okay? So what's what's the basic step? The basic step is given Capital X equals little x, you condition on the event that the total number of particles in the time interval was x. The total number of rare events was x. So now that's fixed. So there were x heads in total, little x heads in total, or little x particles in total. Okay, we have um, the distribution, or conditional on, let's put it this way, conditional on, x equals little x, uh, we have that x of a is the number of detected particles that will be binomial of size x and parameter p. We just have the number of heads in x tosses of a coin. Okay? Is that, is that clear? So there were x events Okay, <clears throat> and so now how many am I going to actually detect of those? Well, I flip a coin, probably P of coming up heads, to so sort of count how many. Now I'm going to, and I'm going to count for only the number of particles that were. The number of particles is X. Okay, so that means that the probability that X of A is equal to uh, Y or whatever. given that capital X is equal to X, is equal to X choose K. Let's see. Uh, P, the probability, I'm going to get K of them, and then I have 1 minus P, the X minus K. All right, so that's the conditional probability. That's the conditional distribution of capital X of A. Now, how do I find the unconditional distribution of capital X of A. What are we going to find? The unconditional distribution. You find is, Px equal to x? Oh. This k goes from 0, 1, 2, and so on, up to x. This is the hint, okay? Conditional on this. I have this. This is the key step to write down this. Then the question is, what's how do you how do you get out of the woods now. They're doing exactly this on page 88. What's the first line they do now? They write the probability that, remember, x in this line 1 on page 88 is the actual x of a, capital N of the Poisson. So what are they doing? They're finding the, the unconditional distribution of x of a by a total probability calculation, finding the marginal of a joint probability mass function. So it's a total probability calculation. What is total probability? Maybe we should go through that. Because we never used that terminology before. This is using conditioning again. It's another conditioning problem. How do I find the probability that x is equal to 
how do I find the probability that x a this is what I really want. I don't want the division probability. I want this. Okay? With no conditioning. How do I get it? Well, I say this is equal to the probability that x of a is equal to k and x is equal to x, okay, sum on all possible x's. x goes from k to infinity. See, the pro this way, if you actually go from scratch, it's a lot easier to see how to do it. Because I basically want to take all possibilities from capital X, but it, capital X can't be less than k. Because I sampled from x coins, you see. So you get like this. Now, this, this is the joint probability mass function. What this is actually then the marginal, okay, of a joint probability. But this is what I'm doing here. I'm just taking all, but that means just take all possibility for capital X. Now, right, this is the conditional probability times a marginal probability. So this is going to be summation x equals k to infinity. Probability x of a is equal to k, given x equals to x, times the probability that x equals to x. So I write out the joint probability as a conditional times an unconditional like that. That's called total probability. Um, well, this is a total probability calculation. Another way to talk about it. We use this condition. Okay? Any comments about this? Okay, and then it just falls out. This you plug in is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the x over x factor. Okay? This you plug in, that you head down there, nasty thing. Okay? Then it's a sum. But only from x goes from k to infinity. And then you can see what they did in the book, hopefully. See if you can figure out the, the nasty summation. Okay? You get it. Uh, it's the series for e to the a or whatever comes in. So you plug this in. Okay. You plug this in. What is this? This is, we said, x choose k. p to the k. 1 minus p to the x minus k. Okay, and then you've got to, you get this lambda in here, you get the lambda to the x and all this, and then you just sum this k to the x. x is going from k to infinity. I'm summing out all the possibilities for the Poisson and the variable. Okay? Okay, so now, what's going to happen? Well, let's take this binomial coefficient and rewrite it. It's x factorial over k factorial, x minus k factorial. The x factorials will cancel. That's good, but didn't left with a k factorial. But that's a constant, because x is k. And k started with k, so this is fixed. Okay, k factorial. Then I have an x minus k factorial. So what are we going to do with that? Well, now x is going from k to infinity, so that factorial starts with 0 factorial and goes on up. Then you just match it with this x component and some other junk, and it all falls out. This is shown on page 88. You get an exponential series. You see how they did it? No? <laughs> I'll do it again. Okay. So you get this as an x factorial over a k factorial, x minus k factorial. So x goes from k to infinity. It is a little hard the first time through. Uh, since the example's there, it's not too bad. p to the k. 1 minus p to the x minus k. e to the minus lambda is a constant. I'll pull it out. Okay? Now my lambda of the x, that's not constant because x is changing. And I have my x factorial. The x factorial is canceled. Okay. The k factorial, I can take it outside too. Alright? Right? Then I've got a p to the k. That's also going to be taken out. Get outside. Okay? Lambda of the x, that's not going outside, but what do I want to do? You see, x is going from k to infinity, that means x minus k is going from 0 to infinity. And this x is going from k to infinity. So I'm just going to fix this up and make it an x minus k as well. Put 
an x minus k and put an x lambda to the k. That's the trick, basically. Or I can change the index of summation, but that's too much work. All right? Everybody Why gets confused. Why x minus k? Because x minus k is going from 0 to infinity. Oh. And all these other stuff, were next. I can't get rid of this x minus k factorial. This was already an x minus k. That was good. Just make that one an x minus k by brute force, by making, putting the minus k and putting the k back. Oh. Those lambda to the k can come oh, outside okay. too. Okay? So I got three things coming outside besides the minus lambda. Now I've got a nice little series here. Just with these terms left. x minus k is going from 0 to infinity. Now I can change this order of summation. So this is or the index of summation, e to the minus lambda, I've got a lambda time, a lambda to the k outside, a p to the k outside, the k factorial outside, and then I've got a summation uh, j goes from 0 to infinity, 1 minus p to the j, lambda to the j, and then the j factorial. J equals x minus k. Okay? So I might as well make this part of the example. Okay. But no one will do the example, you'll have the problem. <laughs> okay. So I started thinking of the events in order to understand the problem in terms of flipping a coin with a high number of flips. But then when it actually comes down to it, you do this conditioning argument, you actually start to get into it, then you just forget all that. Okay? So this is an exponential. Why? Because the 1 minus p and the lambda come together as a common base. Common base, right? 1 minus p times lambda all raised to the j. What's a to the j over j factorial? Sum up. Is there an infinity? It's e to the a. All right? So I'll just use e to the a equals summation a to the j over j factorial. j goes from 0 to infinity. Okay? For any capital. So here I'm going to take a equals lambda times 1 minus p. So finally, then, this comes out to be equals e to the minus lambda, lambda p to the k over k factorial. k is my fixed starting frame. Let me let this on this trip. Then I get e to the lambda 1 minus p, okay, with a plus sign there. Done. And now cancel the lambdas and you get exactly what you want. You get e to the minus lambda p. Lambda p to the k equals the k factorial. You've got 3k equals to 0, 1, 2. And I put my k as a variable again. Right? And that's the Poisson distribution. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If I think of the Poisson as a binomial with a large n, and all I'm really doing when I do this defective detection is I'm changing the probability of the coin from p, uh, from, from the original whatever it was, to multiply it down by p. So that's going to change the lambda by multiplying the lambda down by p. So it's like I'm just tossing a different coin. Right. So it makes The actual calculation doesn't require me to think of that. Okay? Oh, okay. Should I say it again? <laughs> Do I need to say it again? All right. Well, anyway, there's a problem, so welcome to it. Other people will have to go online. <laughs> it's one of those kind of problems where this, this calculation is in there. It's just, you have to see it pretty much for one time or figure it out yourself one time. Like, sort of force yourself, well, how am I going to do this sum? I know this is the right thing to do. Oh my God, it comes up. It's an exponential series, all one. Okay.
let's uh, proceed then. Now you know the Poisson distribution real well. <laughs> so one way to learn how to memory, memor memorize the, uh, the formula for the Poisson. <laughs> to do that problem. Okay. Other questions about the homework? These order statistic things? Should we go back and finish up a little bit on the order statistics? Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, 71, 72. I don't even know what for is Okay. What are we looking for? Okay. Problem 71 and 72. It says, let x1 through xn be, in problem 71, let x1 through xn be independent random variables, each with a density function, little f. Find the expression for the probability that the interval minus infinity to x sub super n, or whatever, the, or the uh, maximum of x encompasses at least 100% of the probability mass. So this has to do with the last example in the section or in the chapter about tolerance intervals, roughly speaking. But if we take the problem at face value, we don't even have to read that example, I don't believe. Okay. So nu is going to be, nu is large. Okay, so problem 3.71. New large. Uh, new close to one. I think new close to one. Like yeah, ninety point nine zero. Oh, okay, or something like that. Point nine five, etc. Okay. And we want an interval. infinity to x so this is the maximum of all the observations to cover uh, 100 times new percent of the probability mass uh, me, uh, of the uh, probability mass of uh, uh, I'm, I'm interval Actual interval, right? It's a random interval. Okay, here's the probability density. Okay, a little f here. Okay? And this is an interval that this goes on here and goes up to here. It goes to all the way to minus infinity, right? Okay? This is the interval. So, what do I mean for this interval to cover 9%? It means I want the, the probability mass under the interval to cover minus infinity to x of n. Equals of ninety percent, okay, or ninety-five percent, okay. So what's the problem? We want that to be true, all right. So that I'll have pretty much the. In other words, I want an interval this uh, size to cover the range of all possibilities, okay. Normally, you don't put minus infinity; you put some other kind of interval, like the minimum to the maximum. That's called a tolerance interval. Usually, you, what he's asking you is instead of the minimum and maximum, putting the minus infinity to the maximum. Okay, this is kind of like this, uh, sort of the, the central interval. This should cover the full range of all possibilities, presumably, if n is large. If n is a hundred or something like that, then where x one through x n was a sample of size n, okay, independent random sample size n. From the density f. Okay. This is the minimum. That's the minimum of all the x's. Minimum of x1 through xn. And this is the maximum. It's reasonable to think that, well, 
that's going to cover, it's not going to maybe cover all possibilities for X, obviously. Right? Because I pick another sample, I can always get one up further out. But it's going to cover a, a big range of all possible X values, a big portion of the range. And the larger N is, the higher the probability, it'll actually cover 90% of the probability mass, or 95% of the probability mass. Okay, what's, okay so what's, uh, let's say I want to cover 90% of the probability mass, so fix new, all right? How large should N be? So that with probability 0.95, I will cover 90%. There's two probabilities, <laughs> okay? Because I might only, it might be that I get a very rare sample and I'll get really, you know, all the x's are about the same. Okay, and I get a really small portion of the range of possibilities. Okay, so I will not cover 90% of the probability mass. With, you know, I might not. Right? So it's a, it's a chance, the actual chance, the actual amount that I cover is a random variable. Okay, the actual probability mass that I do cover. The amount that I cover, the probability that's covered, is, can just be written down. It's simply integral minus infinity of x of n. F of x dx, that's the amount covered. Okay? So what's the probability that this is bigger than, what's the probability that this is greater than or equal to? Uh, 90%. Okay. okay. That's the, that's the question. All right. And that will depend on N, obviously. Okay. Then you can get by adjusting n, you can make that as large, that probably as large as you like by making n large enough. Okay. So this is just the cumulative distribution function evaluated capital X of n. So this is the probability that the cumulative distribution function at x. They, what, one of the arguments in actually calculating these types of probabilities in a tolerance interval example is they're saying, well, okay, uh, because capital F is an increasing function, uh, that F of X super N is equal to the maximum of F of X1 up to F of X N. Because capital F is increasing. Right. In other words, I just switched. In other words, this is f of the maximum x1 to xn, but that's the maximum of f of x1 to f of xn. Okay, because that is increasing. This is a, this by definition is f of the maximum of x1 to xn. Okay. Um, This is just the maximum. F of x1 and f of xn, those are each uniformly distributed. This is proposition C or something back in chapter 2. If I apply the cumulative distribution function to a random variable that has that cumulative distribution function, 
I simply get a uniform variable. Okay. Think about it. If I get a, if I get a certain value of x, okay, what happens here? If I get a think of x think of uh, x one being a value that's let's say the 90th percentile of the population. 90 percent of the value, 90 percent of the people have values lower than me. Okay, all right. <laughs> Just think of something good, positive, right? Positive thinking here, folks. Okay. Then what does f do? F to that x makes equals 0.90. This is what the distribution function does. It, it, it marks the level of the percentile, okay? So that means that uh, the 90th percentile corresponds to a value of 0.90. Well, that just means that f of x is going to be uniformly distributed, okay? 90 <laughs> percent, okay, my value is 0.90, and 90 percent of people are below me. This is a uniform variable, okay? For every percentile level. So this is a uniform. So this is a max of a uniform any kind of uniforms, which is uh, u sub n, okay? So the distribution of x of n is, is the distribution of the maximum of a bunch of independent uniforms, okay? And I plug that in, and then you get the answer. So you actually have a very easy calculation. And you just have the max, the, uh, the unknown distribution function now. Okay, so this this answer is going to be independent of the distribution. Isn't that nice? Okay. So you can finish that up. Look at the top. Look at that uh, top. So but maybe this is a little bit confusing here, perhaps. This shouldn't be too bad. Okay, because we have proposition C from chapter two, which told you that. Um, that if you apply the distribution function, then you get a uniform. You can, so you can actually do it by calculation. Proposition C, page 63. Okay? I just reminded you how that goes. The thought process maybe helps you remember it. Think of percentiles and quantiles. Okay? Okay. Well, notably, you can also apply this directly, too, because you could put, you could apply f inverse to both sides, and that won't change the inequality because of the increasing nature, so then you can just get probably the, the maximum x is greater than f inverse of note, okay? Then you can say, okay, what's the probability of the maximum greater than equal something? That's one minus probably the max is less than equal to something. And the, the max is less than equal to something if only if all of them are less than or equal to it, okay? So you get a prime in probabilities there, and then probably the x1 is less than the f inverse of nu is f of f inverse of nu, okay? So you just, the nu comes back out. So you don't have to go through that direction, you can get it this way too, by applying f inverse to both sides, and then working it out. You see that? Because if I want the probability, is, the max is bigger than something. The probability of the min is greater equal to something is good. Probably the max is less than or equal to something is good. That is easy to calculate. Okay? So this is probably the max x i of x one from x n is less than f inverse. So I guess you have to, have to put the less than sign efficient, but this is a continuous distribution, so it's got a density, so I can put less than or equal to. Okay. Okay. What's the probably the, this is probably the, each one of them has to be separately less than f inverse of nu. So you get one minus the probability of x one is less than f inverse of nu. Blah blah blah, comma f x n is less than f inverse of nu. Okay. So if I'm a little bit careful, I don't have to go through this. Identity that was used before. Okay? And what's the, each of these probabilities is the same. 
f of f and there's a no. And they're independent events, so I get the answer in the back of the book. I think I better leave it there. Okay? I'm going to do the whole problem again. Okay. So you can work it out there, too. You don't have to use this identity up here. But still, it's a little more surprising if you just waited the answer from some independent one. Yeah, capital one. There you have it. That's the explanation of why it does. Okay. Well, that tolerance interval is a little crazy. But you have to think about why well, I want to cover, you know, all possibilities. And I sort of want to be confident that, yes, I have covered pretty much a full range of x values. I want to be confident. So well, let's say, well, I want to be 95% confident that I've covered 90% of all x values. How large should n be? That's independent of the distribution. probability comes up. This is the confidence level you get in the answer. Right? Getting out the confidence level. Okay. For a statement that ah, I've covered 90% of the range. Okay. So there's two probabilities. One of them is the, is the range parameter. The other one is the confidence parameter. So they've got alpha is the confidence parameter. An example which way did they do it? Yeah, they probably, he's always messing around the notation as well. Um, it may be a little confusing. Yeah. Yeah, he has, no, he has the alpha as the, um, <laughs> he has the alpha as the range parameter. Okay? Bad usage. Okay, but anyway, because alpha is usually the, uh, Error probability in the confidence level. <laughs> okay, so you've got you confused if you're using the usual jargon of statistics. In this example, e page 106. You put alpha as the range percentage parameter, right? The probability mass coverage. Then he's calculating the confidence level. In the answer. Okay? You're doing the same thing. I think your problem will should make it a little bit easier to understand. It's a little easier calculation. Comments more about this homework? A little nasty, isn't it? But you're covering a lot of ground here. You're covering a lot of ground in those first four weeks. Most of a probability course, okay? More like eight weeks of probability in about four weeks. That's why it's, well, it's kind of a review slash get some new stuff, you know? Flash, it's fast. <laughs> um, it's a little faster. Here's your take home review, okay? So that uh, I'll put it online after class. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned last time, without being on, on the camera, uh, your test will look similar to this. Uh, but I'll change some numbers and stuff. So pretty much you have to figure out how to do it. And then show me you can do it in class. Otherwise it would be probably too hard to just do it cold. It wouldn't be impossible, but I give you a chance to look at this material the way I'm looking at it. Okay, a lot of joint density, conditional density stuff, transforming densities, that's what we did. Um, I didn't put a grad problem on here. I may change that. <laughs> okay. But I put an extra credit problem on. I could make one of the parts the grad part. You know, I said I think that's what I would do. I haven't decided which part it would be. Because there aren't that many parts. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So maybe we should forge ahead into another area, another chapter. I didn't put the new problems on there yet, um, though I did make up the next section, the next test, chapters four and five is going to be the next section of the course. Um, you're going to be, 
you're not going to have this heavy probability density calculation now. But you're going to have some other ideas. So we're going to go into expectation. What do you think? Is there anything else for me to say about this homework? You said 72 was other problems. Should we go back there and let Luke have a glance at it? Was that more of order statistics? Okay. Show the joint CDF of X1 and XN. This is just using the tricks. <coughs> All right, how would I deal with, if I had X1 and XN, how would I deal with, deal with the joint CDF of that? Okay, I need the probability. This is less than the X and this is less than the Y. Okay, now what do I know? What, what are the basic tricks in working with the maximum and the minimum? We saw that this one, the maximum less than the y, that's easy to deal with on its own. But they say that just is equivalent to the event that each individual x1 through xn is less than the y. And they're independent, so they make things up. What about this? This one is not quite as nice. You want the greater than or equal to x in there. Okay. So how am I going to do this? Well, one way to do it is to rewrite this first so that I get the greater than x in there. <laughs> yeah, I still have to deal with the fact that this is a joint event rather than, but then that's going to be, if I can get the greater than or equal to x, then all of them have to be bigger than x, and all of them have to be less than or equal to y. Well, then that can just be written as a joint event, x1 between x and y, x2 between x and y, x3 between x and y. So how do I get this to be greater, or greater than x? <laughs> relationship between P A B and P A complement B. The relationship is that if I add them I get P B. P A complement B plus P A intersect B is equal to P B. That's part the, these two events partition B. Right? They split it in pieces. Not overlapping obviously. So then uh, what I get then is that I want PA intersect B, that is, no, I just isolate this formula, that's therefore PB minus PA inter A complement intersect B. You can calculate PB now, and you can calculate PA complement intersect B. That's a good one. Another trick. <laughs> Another trick for dealing with how to deal with this. What this really was is this is a joint, this is an f of x, y, what I'm saying is, in essence, therefore, is if this is equal to, um, let's see, is equal to, So you, you have to play around with the algebra of sets of it. You would the way you want it to write. I wrote it down in all these things because um, in other words, I just take this condition away. Okay? That's the bigger event, right? I 
put in, and then I subtract that off the bottom down as a sign. Isn't that obvious? <laughs> okay. So that's what it boils down to. So if you want to switch the sign of this inequality, you have to freeze everything else the same to take this one out. And then, all right, so if I had other if I had other variables, I'd have to freeze, freeze those and then to If you're thinking of it in terms of an area under a PDF, is it like you want to find the probability that n points will lie between x and y? Okay, let's go um, ahead and think about it. You can think about it that way. This is, well, all right. So now I'm going to do a bird's eye view of an x, y point. Okay? So here's an x, y point. Okay. So if I want, that's bird's eye view now, and I want the problem, so the density is sitting up here is 10. All I'm working with pretty much is um, set here. So, so what, what I have is that I want the probability of this. I want the volume underneath the density surface over that region. Okay, that's what capital F of x, y is. The volume underneath that region. So over that region underneath the density surface. So there's a density surface sitting out there. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I want the volume underneath. Okay. For that for that floor. This is a floor. Okay? So how can I this is the point x, y. All right. That's area. So lines, so it's, it's f of x, y equals the double integral minus infinity of x minus infinity of y until f of u. So this is what you're thinking about in terms of the density? Is this what you want? That's that's that was a, that's what I was thinking. Okay, think about it that way. Kind of the and what is this? <laughs> okay. So now if I if, if in terms of the picture, how does it come out? Okay? So that volume, that volume is what I want. That's a volume integral, right? I can calculate it as a difference of volumes. What it is is this it's it's the volume go all the way out here to um, x equals infinity, all right? So go all the way out here to infinity, okay? So this is f of infinity of y equals a volume under the, the uh, density of the surface. We're going over, and then subtract off. So take everything to the back over here, all right? And subtract off this piece. one way you can think about it geometrically if you want. In terms of volumes under the density surface. That's how the CDF comes out. That's the way this, the joint density function is arranged. comments about this? Or this doesn't seem to be helping that much. Is this what you were referring to now? Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't seem to be helping anybody else too much. So. <laughs> but I think it's a valid way to think about it in terms of density. Yeah. All right. I think we've covered a lot of bases. Joint density, conditional density. I mean, what this author did in these chapters, he really got into the CDF. That's almost, that's never done in the 
first course of probability. And we get that much in the cumulative distribution function. We usually define it and say, can you graph one and then go on? You never come back to it. Here, though, transforming random variables into other random variables to, to find the density of the transformed random variable, the one of the basic methods is the distribution function method. Find the distribution function method of the transformed variable, then differentiate to find the density. And many other problems were by the distribution function method. And here we find the distribution function relatively easily of the joint distribution of uh, the joint distribution of of the minimum to the maximum. So we teach you these tricks, you know, some little probability tricks along the way here with these problems that you need to know to become a probabilist. <laughs> okay. So in terms of what, so this, what, what this is in terms of the integration is this is double integral by s infinity to uh, where it's say infinity. So, well, so if you actually write it down, is then, so in terms of things, this is therefore equal to integral minus infinity to infinity minus infinity to y, f of u, v, u, v, u, into the actual expression minus, how would I do this rectangle? This is, uh, y goes from minus infinity, but x doesn't go from minus infinity. x only goes from x to infinity, okay? And then y goes from minus infinity to y. F of u of v, 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 u. So in terms of the joint, in terms of the graphs, that's the way it looks like. Okay. Does that make sense? And this, we said, was fairly easy to calculate in this example, where f of v was the joint density of the minimum and maximum. This is what was easy to calculate. It was x is down here, going up there, and the y is up here, and infinity is down there. So if you want to look at it that way, something everybody will have a little different way of thinking about it. Okay? Is that does that finish it up? I hope. This is the easiest way for sure. Just to just write it. Just write it in terms of, of probability joint probability. So this is I finished that. That chapter is closed. Let's go on. Oh, more fun. Oh, I close like this. No, don't go any further. Well, we don't have any homework due next week. We will have homework due the following week. We have a test next week. So, I'll just give you a little, let's go a little bit slower here because, but it'll still be some good review. In fact, I was thinking of putting an extra credit problem that has to do with one of the very first examples of this chapter. But the chapter starts off kind of with a bang. You start differentiating power series right off the top, and I don't really want to do that. Because people get scared. Okay. <laughs> you bring in some other mathematics. But what is the, so what we're going to do is bring in the expected value. And of course, the book is extremely rich in examples, so he's going to have things like um, DNA sequencing and all kinds of stuff. But it's really not as bad as it looks. He's just trying to give you a context for it. Okay. So don't be scared off. There are a couple examples that might be scary. But, <laughs> but we'll come to them as necessary. If there's a problem that's assigned as alpha, hey, there was a problem assigned. Oh, that's a good problem. But there was it happened to cover it, you know. So some of his some of the problems that I'm choosing actually are backed up exactly by examples. So that one last time, remember with the Bernoulli variable, you know, he had uh, I forgot which problem number it was. 3.24 that was driving people nuts. That was actually just that a special case of that example, the Bayesian inference. 324 was a very was a special case of the Bayesian inference example. So do do read the examples. So if you memorize examples, we'll be alright. You should be pretty much. Uh, suppose we toss three fair coins. In 
independently. I think this bucket I'm going to get through today. Let's see. Count the number of heads. So you simply have a binomial variable. Right? Binomial variable. Size three and parameter one half. This is going to be fair. The probability mass function is easy to write down. P of x. I think usually use P of k, but sometimes I use x instead of k. Uh, summation. Excuse me, not summation. Simply three choose x. One half to the x. One minus one half to the three minus x. If I write it down, which comes out to be three choose x. One half to the third. X equals zero, one, two, and three. In other words, write down the prob the possibilities. Write down this. Write down X and P of X. X could be a number of heads could either be zero, one, two, or three. With respective probabilities. What? What are the probabilities for three coins? One eighth, three eighths, three eighths, and one eighth. Go to binomial coefficients one three three one, and the factor one eight. All right, so that's the probability mass function. Okay, imagine now that we perform the experiment of tossing the three coins many times. They capital many times. So we're going to toss three coins. We get some number of heads, right? Then we're going to do it again. This is a poor man's way of simulating binomial <laughs> distribution, right? Just take the coins and do it over and over. Don't use a computer. So imagine that process. the experiment. I'll toss in the three points. Many times. Say, just to give it a number, capital N times. Where N is very large. Denote the outcomes. For the number of heads as x1, x2, up to xn. And you can use a lowercase capital X, as I don't care at this point, because I'm just going to be talking uh, to motivate the definition. And the average, what is the average? One over n times x1 plus x2 plus and so on plus xn expected to be. So I'm using, and the word expected I'm going to underline because he's going to use the word expected in exactly this matter. In other words, expected value, what does that mean? When I toss a coin, when I toss three coins, what's the number of heads expected to be? Huh? One and a half? How can I get one and a half heads? I can't. But I can get an average of one and a half heads per toss. Per experiment, that is. Right? Just toss up the three coins. I get an average of one and a half heads per experiment. And that's what I should be expecting to get. Isn't that right? Is it one and a half? I should best just right in the middle here, right? One and a half, three. It's the halfway between, between zero and three. I should be getting one and a half heads per experiment. Isn't that right? How do you check that? Check. Indeed. Oh, well. Let's hear the relative frequency interpretation. The relative frequency interpretation. Do you ever hear of that in your first course? What is the relative frequency interpretation? You don't know?
it just means that if the probability of getting a 1 is 3 eighths, okay, this is the mathematical probability of a 1 is 3 eighths, that's our model. That means about 37.5% of all the tosses will result in a 1 coming up. In other words, I go ahead and I'm going to give my x1, just think in your mind, what's that, 1 or 2 or 3, right? Think of a sequence of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. Okay, so you got a very long sequence of zero, ones, twos, and threes. Just make up something in your mind. Zero, one, two, two, one, zero, zero, three, one, two, 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 one, three, three, zero, 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 etc. Okay. Very long sequence, capital N digits here, okay? What percentage of all those digits are ones? Well, it depends on the sequence, right? But the relative frequency interpretation is that when add capital N is very large, this number, the percentage of ones should be about uh, three, three eighths times 100%, right? Or 37.5%, isn't that right? Okay, that's the relative frequency interpretation. The actual number of ones that I get up. So what is this average? This average then, how could I actually average? I teach this all the time when I do expected value. I have to add up all these numbers, right, and divide by the total number, capital N. Well, a very novel way to do that is, <laughs> since there's only four different digits, is just figure out how many zeros there are. Instead of, you know, instead of actually adding them up successfully, pretend you were doing this on a pencil and paper. Instead, you would just count the number of zeros, okay? What kind of zeros you forget? So let's count the number of ones, right? Count the number of ones, all right? And then we say, okay, the, the total contribution to the sum of the ones is the number of ones times one. The total contribution to the sum of the twos is the number of twos times two. The total contribution to the sum of the threes is, and I would have to do the threes if I don't count the zeros, all right, is the number of threes times three. Uh, the number of ones, okay, in the in the sam in the among x1 through xn is about uh, three eighths times capital n. Okay, that's the number of ones x1 through xn. So about three eighths times capital n. So x1 plus and so on plus xn is about 0, excuse me, 1 over 8 times uh, n over 8 times 0 plus 3 eighths n times 1. So it'll be 3 eighths n ones. I need to multiply by 1 because that's the contribution of the sum. 3 eighths n times 2 plus 1 eighth n times 3. So this is the novel way of adding up the numbers. Okay? Okay? Therefore, therefore, the average, therefore, average is about right, uh, one eighth times zero. I divide by n, so it just comes comes out, right? I put the capital N in, and I'm going to take it back out. <laughs> okay. So really, I'm cheating. I'm using the relative frequency interpretation, but um, let's go with it anyway. Plus three eighths, because this is the motivation times. 1 plus 3 eighths times 2 plus 1 eighth times 3, which comes out to be equal to 3 plus 6 plus 3 is 12 eighths, or 3 halves, 1 and a half, which is right, why it's bigger. So that's what we expect the average to be. That's now called the expected value. So define EX equals. 0 times 8 plus 1 times 3 eighths plus 2 times 3 eighths plus 3 times 1 eighth equals summation of the values of x possible times the probability of x. Sum on x. I think the author puts x sub i and then sum on i. Because he originally defined his Greek variable in terms of the values x sub i that he would take on, but this is just a little bit shorter hand. Okay? And that's going to be the definition of the expected value. For okay, 
any discrete random variable, as long as the sum exists. In other words, if an infinite sum, what does it mean to exist? Okay, so, so this is going to be the definition of EX, mathematical expectation, also called, or expected value, also called the mean, has many synonymous names. Uh, the mean or expected value or mathematical expectation what it really is is what the average is expected to be. In other words, when I actually do this experiment, let's say a thousand times, I should get something kind of close to one and a half. Okay. I don't. How close? That'll be a question. Another question. So this is defined to be the mathematical expectation when, uh, if I put absolute values everywhere, then I get a convergent series. Remember, the probabilities are positive, so I don't have to put an absolute value there. When the absolute value. <clears throat> okay, so then the author is going to take some examples and do them. We're going to start next time with that. Uh, the geometric random variable, the Poisson random variable, the binomial random variable. He's going to mostly start with discrete cases first, then we'll go on to the continuous case. What would be the formula in the continuous case? Any guesses? Can I grow Okay, yeah. So what's the what's the translation? So the continuous case uh, integral minus infinity over infinity uh, x. So the ex mathematical expectation. What would play the role of the what would play the role of the uh, probability p of x up? Pdf. Pdf times dx. I'm going to emphasize that this plays the role of p of x up. That's the probability. So this is a continuous sum, x times probability. Okay? As long as integral of absolute value of f of x dx is finite. Now the author is going to, interestingly enough, is going to get into this condition of whether the expectation exists or not. He's always going to push it just a little bit more, which is very nice because he has a nice picture. There's a very nice picture uh, in this book which I haven't seen in too many other textbooks on page 120, where it shows a graph of partial sums divided by n. It actually shows this process right here as capital N increases for some simulated values of some random variables. One is a normal random variable. The other one is a Cauchy random variable, which we haven't discussed yet. One of the graphs actually just converges nicely to a nice limiting point, which is my expected value. The other one does, doesn't seem to do that. What's that? What's up with that? Both nice continuous random variables. Oh, because one of them, the expectation exists, the other one doesn't. Hmm. It does okay. for the discrete case. It's okay. It's okay here. As long as How come it's not okay? No, if I had an infinite discrete case, it wouldn't necessarily. I can, I can find an example that doesn't work there. So, like, a bunch of numbers. Yeah, there are yeah. infinitely many discrete values, okay, so that the uh, expectation is infinite. All the x values are positive, but the sum diverges. Ah. Then I can get a graph like that on the bottom and take one hundred and twenty. Okay, bottom of page one twenty. It looks like that. And then that'll be it for today. <laughs> We're a little over time. Bottom of page one twenty. You see how the graph is jumping around. What happens is that every once in a while you get an ex this stupendously large value, which swaps out the sums. Okay? And therefore, either positive or negative stupendously large value. And it swamps out everything else. And so then the, the sums remain basically constant for a while until something else happens and it trails off and does some other stuff. Then you get a stupendously large value again and it jumps it again.
you know, it was a pretty nice illustration of expectation. Let's call it a day. All right? Thank you.